What's up, Hootay Nation? It is Orange and Black Insider slash New Stripe City. Orange is the new black crossover. We are missing one member of our super team, but we are here today at Happy Hour Edition to answer your questions. This is your show. You guys take control. We're going to pretend like we know what we're talking about. I'm Anthony Cazenza, joined by my usual partner in crime, John. How are you doing? Doing good on this very sunny Friday afternoon, but I believe I'm like the most north based um, person on this panel right now. So let's <laughs> let's go let's go to, to our other guys. Ace, how are you doing, man? I'm doing pretty good, man. Glad to be here. Uh, it's, it's a sunny day in Florida. I know that's probably what we say most of the time, but I'm glad that Ohio's definitely getting some love in the old hometown for sure. Zim, you got the hell of answers. I know you want to say what's up to everybody. How you doing, buddy? Hello, everybody. Let's get it on. Let's talk to Hooday, middle of the day. What are we waiting for? Let's get into this. Like now, um, I'm really, really happy that you guys uh, decided to do this because on Friday afternoons, I absolutely do nothing except look at posts and stuff online. So this is my chance to interact with people. Let's do it. Well, you're you're filled up on some Chick Fil A. They're not a sponsor of our show, but you're you're fueled up. So they can be. Uh, yeah, they can't be. Out. Yeah, if we got some Chick Chick Fil A reps out there. Let let us know. Hey, I'm uh, your man. I'm your man. Y'all want to go in? <laughs> hey, spicy chicken. Del- uh, no, no, I'm not gonna give y'all too much. All right, cool. <laughs> no, no, you're good, man. You're good. I hope all you guys are doing well. Here's the deal. Uh, in case you are not familiar with this show, there are a number of different ways you can get in touch with us and submit a question to us. We have live chats going on the Cincy Jungle Facebook page on the Orange or Black Insider YouTube channel, as well as a live comment section on cincyjungle.com. There is a post there. We're monitoring the Twitter accounts of Cincy Jungle and OBI. And then, of course, we've got a call, text line, 949-542-6241. If you're too shy to call in, give us a text. That's cool, too. And then we're, we're looking at some emails as well, the OB insider at gmail.com. So let's get it going. We'll just kind of ra- round table this thing. And as, uh, as you guys see some interesting ones, feel free. Let's, let's pop them up. I guess let's start here since this was one of the, uh, the first one. Well, I, first of all, let's let Pete, Pete asked what's Matt doing. Unfortunately, Matt couldn't join us. He's doing a little family thing. So I guess technically that was kind of the first question that came through. So unfortunately Matt can't do it, but we'll, we'll, we'll get him back on here. But Let's go. I, who wants to bat lead off here? Because I've got a question for Ty, from Tyrone on Twitter. Why are the Bengals not aggressively pursuing a backup wide receiver? I'll, I'll start with Ace. Ace, what do you think about this one, bud? I think, I mean, I don't know if we could say that they're not aggressively pursuing one. I mean, they did check in on D.D. Westbrook. Uh, so it obviously shows that they're not done at the wide receiver position And we don't know what conversations at the moment are being had behind the scenes. And obviously, there's also still training camp cuts and things of that nature that could happen. So I think that they actually are pursuing a a backup receiver. When you talk about where D.D. Westbrook came from, you know, at one point he did kind of get stuck in the logjam at receiver that the Jags recently had. But before that, he was one of their starting receivers. And to bring that guy on as your potential fourth or fifth receiver, I think would be definitely an aggressive move. And it's showing that they're still trying to get – more speed on the wide receiver core. So I think that they are being aggressive. It's just, you know, they're doing their due diligence. And D.D. Westbrook did suffer an ACL injury. So you do have to check his knee out and make sure that if you do or want to sign him, um, that you do your due diligence. But also he's got offers from the Chiefs and stuff like that. So there's things like that that are weighing in the balance. They have to see exactly where they're at. So I think that they actually will be uh, aggressive pursuing another backup receiver, especially with the return game where it's at. What, who wants to go from Team Chase to answer this one? We got two members of Team Chase here. So uh, what, what what do you guys think about backup wide receiver? Good stuff, though, Ace, especially about D there. Yep, appreciate it. I'll just say this real quick. Right now, it's really all about who you know. D.D. Westbrook happens to know both Samaji P. Ryan and Joe Mixon from their days at Oklahoma. So there's a connection there. I'm sure that there's a whole thing with D.D. as well. Like when he came out of Oklahoma, there was some off the field stuff that I'm sure the Bengals want to want to vet. He's been in the league for four years now. Nothing really has come up in that sense. But like Ace said, he got kind of caught up in the loop in Jacksonville, never really found a role. And they kept investing in the receiver position. And then him suffering that injury was not ideal in going into a contract year. So there's no real rush, I guess, to go out and sign DD, but at the same time, the fact that they are looking at him, they brought in a receiver for the minicam trial today and Jimmy Robinson, they are still interested in adding speed. It's just a matter of kind of when instead of if. I, I was going to, I feel like you guys said everything I could say. Uh, I wouldn't say that they're being super aggressive, but when you're aggressive at the number five spot and take Jamar Chase, 
it 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 does it doesn't take away the fact that you need depth, but it, it now pushes that now down the, the priority list, I think, in my mind. So um, there are guys that they're working out that I really do like, like Jimmy Robinson, like uh, John just said. I, I really like him a lot. Uh, there's some guys that I think um, that they're they're going to probably maybe take a flyer on, too. But you got to think, too, when they sign Mike Thomas, I think they're pretty much saying, like, that's the backup slot. Um I know that I know some staff members are pretty high on Trent Irwin. I know some uh, guys, you know, like most fans are still high on Auden Tate. So um, it's not the highest priority, I think, in the, on the whole entire team for sure. But depth is always needed. So, but but they're kicking the tires on some guys as we saw in the workouts today. You know, like there's some there's some legit dudes there. Yeah, that, that's kind of what this what this rookie minute camp is part of it's about is seeing if there are some diamonds in the rough here to to bring into training camp and, and round out some of those positional groups that need some additional help. You know, Scotty Washington's another guy I think that's hanging around that that's an interesting guy as well. I've I've kind of kept my eyes in here. I haven't heard much about him uh, in terms of him flashing, but just the size, the profile, and whatnot, kind of a little audentatish a little bit. So that's an interesting guy. I think he's not a rookie per se, but. Um, you know, a guy that may may break out with an actual preseason training camp, that sort of thing. We got uh, a text, and then I, I want you guys for sure to pick some out, but we got a text that came in from area code 513. What kind of day one impact do you see Joseph Osai, Cam Sample, and Tyler Shelvin having? Basically those round three and four type of guys. Uh, John, you want to go first on this one, bud? Sure, man. Um, Osai is getting the snaps that Carl Austin took. No, that, that's not exactly right. Trey Hendrickson, Sam Hubbard is your starters. Osai, I guess, fills the role that Carl Lawson used to have as that pass rushing specialist. So he's on the field like at least 20 snaps a game. Most of them are just going after the quarterback off the edge. That's what they want him to be. That's what they want him to develop into. And assuming that Sam Hubbard is extended this offseason, he's going to be under contract for the next four years. That's how long Trey Hendrickson is there. So you're not really rushing Osai to become a starter. And I think the same kind of goes for Cam Sample, too. I believe he talked with Jeff Hops on the Bengals.com. He said that he, right now he's more comfortable rushing from the outside, but I'm sure that they want to give him opportunities to rush from the inside because they do need guys who are explosive at that three technique spot on passing downs. And then with Shelvin, it's just him just being behind DJ Reader. He'll be on the field for you know, a handful of snaps a game, depending on who they play. He could play more in those AFC North games against the Steelers, Ravens, and Browns, but he's not going to be on the field as much as I would I would assume a sigh and sample are going to be. How many people. snaps? How many snaps, John, first year? How many snaps, Shelvin? Like in for the entire 17-game schedule? Entire year. I, I would say about 200-ish, maybe. Maybe a little bit less. I'm going 400. Really? Hmm. Want to expand on that? I just think that some of the guys that are going to be there, like in, you know, like go go look at freedom, go look at all the guys. Like when anybody went down and all these guys that paid in it, think about all the snaps that Covington. You know, Covington just started with the Chargers or whatever. There's a lot of snaps that I think, yeah, right now they got 14 defense alignment, but they're not going to go to camp. I mean, they're not going to start off the season with 14. And I think Shelvin's one of the guys that's going to push forward through a lot. And like you're saying, DJ Reader is going to start off, but. Coming off the injury he had last year, I think they're not going to push him as much as they probably would. Um, and, and then also, too, in a lot of these uh, circumstances in some of these games, I think it'll be a heavy, you know, run packages with our division that are just going to put Shelvin on the field more. And I just think he's going to beat out a couple of guys. Like, I think he's, yeah, like early on, like he's just going to demand more snaps. And I think for most people hearing that at home, and then and, and the fact that you got an extra game. For most people at home, probably saying, "Well, 400 snaps, like that's really 200 something. Is not that like that's like how many did Keem Davis Gaither have year one? Maybe like 180 or something like that. Like I have to look. It was pretty low, I think. It's got to be like somewhere around there. Like I just think Shelvin's gonna have a bigger role than that year one. I really do. Well, I think and Ace, I wanna I wanna have you weigh on this too. I mean. In terms of value, I mean, I love Jamar Chase. I think Jackson Carmen's going to help out. In terms of like value and those players and how they can help the team specifically, I, I really those were three of my favorite kind of players in, in in this draft class. I really like them. I know Shelvin is a limited player in terms of role, but what I think, at least with Shelvin, what you're going to see is you're probably going to see peaks and valleys in terms in terms of games where he has a lot of snaps 
games where he doesn't, where the matchups make sense that he's going to come in and play a lot of snaps where they don't obviously situations, whether you're up a lot, down a lot, that sort of thing will play into it too. But that's kind of how I see it. I, I think, I don't think Shelvin's going to have a ton of snaps, but I think, I think he'll, he'll have a decent little role in this, in this defense, particularly as you're going up against the Baltimore's Pittsburgh, looking to reestablish the run, that sort of thing. I think the divisional games is where I personally see him kind of getting some more, more run there. What do you think Ace? Uh, yeah, I mean, I was I was trying to take a look here at uh, the snaps for Akeem Davis Gaither. It looks like he's right at probably about 270 to 300, it looks like. Um, I tried to exclude, obviously, the special team stuff there. But I, I think uh, – I feel like I'm in the minority on this because I know that he's a nose guard and a nose tackle. But I think eventually if Marlon Hobby is able to, de- to develop him correctly, I think he's got enough quickness to get some pressure on the quarterback. Like there were plays where – he was in the backfield, but he just wasn't in the right area. And like, if they're able to kind of coach up that technique a little bit, I'm not saying that he's going to be like, you know, 10 sack guy, like maybe he can get two sacks. Right. And that's big for someone that plays his position. Uh, But I do think that he will play a vital role just because like John said, in those games when we're playing against the Ravens and the Browns, they generally keep those guys and load up on those guys. And they're usually active that week. And when we go against, um, passing teams, and I think that's why John was saying that it would be so low, is sometimes they inactivate guys like that. Um, so I think for those games, he's definitely going to play a key role. Uh, but the big X factor I think that we're uh, we're not talking about in all of this is Hobby. How does he like to play his guys? I think we had to go back and look at how they were used. If I'm not mistaken, and don't quote me on this, but I think someone said that he kind of likes to do a committee kind of thing and, and throw a bunch of different guys in there, which makes it intriguing and interesting. And I think that's the biggest X factor to me. How does he use Cam Sample? Is he going to rush him from the outside and the inside? Is he going to mix it up? It's To me, it's hard to see Cam Sample having a ton of snaps this season just because he's going to be behind, like John said. You talk about Hubbard. You got Hendrickson. You still got Khalid Kareem. You got uh, Asai as well. So it's going to be tough to see what his role is, you know, year one. Osai, I think, like John said, he's going to use the OG position that Carl Lawson had, not when he became a starter this season, but his original role where he comes in on passing downs and rushes the passer. The other thing I think that's interesting about him is he also can do what they wanted Carlos Dunlap to do last year, which wasn't really a fit for him, which is dropping back in the coverage, him being a former linebacker. Um, he's obviously had some experience doing that. So I think that that's another niche that they could use him in. Uh, but they still had Carlos lined up as an edge rusher when they did that. Uh, so I think out of all of them, I actually do think Shelvin has an impact just because of how much Baltimore and the Browns will want to run the ball. And like him just being able to sit there. And when we saw DJ Reader go out, it was just night and day in terms of that run defense. And when you're facing teams like that, he's definitely going to play a factor. But I think Osai and Shelvin are going to be the guys that probably flash the most. It, it, just, it just to expand, I'm sorry, uh, Andrew, no, go ahead. just really quick. I said 400. That is like 20-something you know, snaps again. I, I just think like for, for some odd reason, it could be health or whatever. I just think later in the calendar, I just he's, he's going to get a lot more snaps than what – a lot of those rookies are doing because what he's doing, you know, what he's offering year one is something that they need right away. Whereas Osai, yeah, they need that, but they're only going to need that in in key spots. In in and you got to be up. Like if they're playing from down, like Osai isn't going to see the field. So that that's what it's all based on. It's just like health, and there's going to be some games where teams are going to run, 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 and I could just see them interchanging with reader a lot 400 might have been a little high but i'm thinking 17 to 18 snaps as it averages out throughout the whole season that that's how i kind of land right. close to 400 not, not to go against you zim but if teams are up that would kind of also flip to a side as well like if a team is up 10 or something like that shelvin's not going to be in as much either so yeah i, I definitely agree like if it's a situation where it's close and they're running right. that's definitely going to cater to shelvin if they're up by more it's probably going to cater to to all side for sure for sure sample i just for some reason calls back to my memory in terms of like his build and and maybe what they're looking to do with him a little bit like wallace gilberry if you remember him yes. where he would he'd play off the edge they'd kick him inside he was not the six five huge wingspan guy per se like a dunlap a michael johnson but he was kind of a little stockier and 
um, was an effective player. So I hope Sample kind of is able to emulate at least a little bit of that as a rotational guy and, and a movable piece up front for the for the team. Zim, I'm going to let you uh, – sched- did you scour the, the live chats here for anything that looks interesting in terms of a question? Man, I could run through like 20 of these bad boys right now. What y'all wanted to um, – uh, uh, Wyatt Herbert – Tyrone says Wyatt Herbert will make the team – uh, I think this is a long shot, but I do think he sticks around and for some crazy reason doesn't get snagged up. Uh, Diddy said, who they fellas? Appreciate that. Um, he also said he likes my hat and my shirt. Appreciate that as well. Uh, yeah, I didn't see DJ Rita was a huge loss. It's not. It's a lot of comments. Hold on, there's <laughs> there's one here. I think you might actually like this one, Zoom. Okay. It says, um, do you guys think Akeem Davis Gaither will be used as an edge on some downs with his speed and athleticism? I think he must have been watching one of our shows where I said that or something. <laughs> I don't I know. I don't know. Like I, Tyrone T on fire in the comments today, but I, I, I got a feeling he's been watching the show. Uh, but in the Dolphins game, if you guys get a chance to ever watch or whatever, Akeem Davis Gaither only had about eight, eight to ten snaps, I believe, in that game. But in that game, they had him in a goal line stand where he had to make like three or four plays off the edge. And it kind of got my mind thinking and rolling at that point. If Lou Anarumo isn't creative enough to go make, you know, like get him into, cause you know, later on in the season, they scaled him back at linebacker and took away snaps. I think one of the easiest things for him would just be coming off the edge in some unique packages. If they can scheme it up that, that way, I, I guess I, that's something that I did. I toured around with on one of the shows or whatever. What do you think about that, John? Do you think that that's a possibility? I know that the weight is the biggest issue for sure, right? But I think it's something to be said about what he did in college and how that translates to the NFL. And it, it's it's a hybrid position. On the subject of weight, um, I don't. I have no visual confirmation of this, but someone told me that Akeem looks yoked right about now he's been training a lot i think he goes to the same gym that drew sample and even joey b does in in cincinnati so i mean he was 224 when he was drafted so he was already on the smaller side to be that type of hybrid player but that, i mean he got away with just rushing the passer at that size because he played at app state you go to the, to the nfl you play more on, on of an off ball role like you're gonna get into trouble with that and that was mainly his biggest issue he could be relied to just fill those gaps and fill those fits as a run defender he was used like primarily as a coverage player. Like I think something along the lines of 70, 80% of his snaps were in pass defense. And to that Miami game, I, I believe like he was lined up over the edge or like as, as an overhang defender, he motioned out uh, or he followed a, a receiver split out wide and he made a play. On, then he made a play on the ball. And then like right after that, he made a play uh, again against the run. So there are yeah, definitely where, where he's running and then he flies like Superman exactly. off the edge. Like, yeah, like, like he's pumped, like three, four yards like in the air. Like it's the craziest he, thing. He's athletic as hell. He just needs more bulk. And I think he, that's what he's doing right now to fulfill that type of role. But that's just the thing. There's so many bodies in this front seven right now to just fill out and just see where these guys end up fitting. But you can do a lot of things with Davis Gaither. It just really it was really going going to take him a year to fill out his frame and get kind of used to the speed of the NFL. Taking some more questions from you all, and uh, we'll be here for a little while longer. We've got a lot in the chats. I've got another couple got, of texts. Uh, Anthony, out, so. I got, I got yeah. one for you. Can I give you one real quick? Go for it. Go for it, man. Al Pratt says record prediction. Oh, boy. <laughs> I, I was wondering if we were going to get to this one. Uh, so I, I, we talked about this on our show last week. I put it on a post on Cincy Jungle. I, I kind of – I'm teetering between 8 and 9 and 9 and 8 personally. Um, I, I think there's going to be a, 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 some competitiveness in this team. I think they're going to be scrappy. I think there's going to be a, a, a potential for a hot start, um, even with Joe Burrow coming back and rehabbing an injury and all of that. I think the, sk- the schedule is a little bit more favorable, at least as we sit here in May. It seems a little bit more favorable than that last month, which is just like, oh, my God. Um, so I, I, I could see this team – you know, being around that 500 mark, will that be enough to appease a lot of people? I don't know. Will it be enough to keep Zach Taylor's job? Probably, especially if they're kind of in a playoff picture by mid season of some kind, whether they're fighting for a wild card spot or something, but I kind of am teetering back and forth a little bit between eight and nine wins personally. What about you guys? Uh, I think for me, I, I think you hit the nail on the head. I think nine and eight is definitely possible. To when I saw those two first games, I I was looking at it and I'm like, I don't want to 
be super a super optimist, but those two seem like winnable games. I mean, you talk about the Vikings, you're talking about the Bears. Uh, obviously, the Vikings, they were kind of a, a disappointment. Like, you know, they went from being considered a Super Bowl favorite to severely underperforming. And, you know, Kirk Cousins isn't that bad. I think he's better than people give him credit for. But I think it's definitely a winnable game. The only thing that sucks is it's coming right when Joe Burrow's, you know, coming off of a major injury. But it's not that hard of a matchup that we can't win this game. And I think someone else brought up something that was important as well in regards to Hunter, even though he's one of the top edge rushers in the game. Uh, collectively, they didn't have a great pass rush, which is crazy to, to think because they have Mike Zimmer as their coordinator. And the same can be said as well, I believe, with the Bears as well. Even though they have Khalil Mack, collectively, it's not a great pass rush. And there's two teams that somewhat struggle on the offensive side of the ball. And so if the Bengals come out and they're on fire, uh, especially with T. Higgins, Tyler Boyd, Joe Mixon, you know, if we jump on these guys early, it could definitely lean our way. And so I'm thinking, I'm definitely thinking nine and eight, um, especially with, I think, uh, I believe it's six of the last nine home games. I think Dan Horde said are home games. So yeah, I, I like that part of it personally. For, for me, I'm going to go with my boy uh, Ocho earlier today. He, he proclaimed that it was over eight. Um, and he said if he loses, he's going to give up McDonald's. So mm-hmm. I'm going to oh, go with him. Oh, that's serious. That's a yeah. serious bet then. Yeah. Yeah. So he says he's uh, if, if that happens and he's giving up McDonald's. So I think it's, I think it's good. Yeah, it's eight, nine. But I, I, I think nine games, man. I, I'm, I think so that's You don't do bit. that. You don't do predictions now. I really don't. But for the sake of the show, yeah, this is like he knows I don't really – I don't like doing that. Uh, we, Neither when, is when, this guy. Neither when, is this when, guy. When, I, when I pose a question to people, I always be like, we're going to go 17-0, right? In like some weird, cynical way, I always just say it. And then I just let it play out. Because you just don't know, you mm-hmm. know, based on who's going to be available. If everyone is available, this team, to me, can win nine games. But as we know, that's just not the way life works. It, it, it's May. Like there's week one lines for games, and I just think it's freaking hysterical because we don't even know like who's going to be healthy and stuff. But yeah, like that's it is what it is. Like the Bengals haven't won double digit games since 2015. Like it's been a long time since this team has been good. Every off season, you think they're better than what they have before, but like Sim said, stuff happens. Plans change, lineups change, the depth chart gets utilized. How can this team respond? to similar adversities that has had to go through for the past four to five years. How is this same coaching staff who has won six games in two years going to make those improvements to take that next step for them to win nine to 10 games? They have to beat some really quality teams. They haven't really done that in recent years. It's a lot of projection. It's a lot of hope, but it's a lot of projection based off what they are right now, what we know them to be. I think if they were to be an above 500 team, it would have to be a lot like 2011 when no one expected them to be anything and they surprised and snuck into the playoffs. Now that's possible. It's tough in this division and against the quarterbacks that they're facing. But yeah, if everything goes right, absolutely nine to 10 wins is possible. This offense has the capability of scoring against any defense in the league and keeping up with any offense in the league, but they're going to have those opportunities. It's just a matter of them taking advantage of it. They seem to be in a better place in terms of depth where in certain spots that they, rather than the past couple of years, I mean, they, they seem to be decimated in, in some very specific position groups. And this draft class, this free agency period specifically has really shown an effort to shore up those areas where they just have been ravaged by injury. So hopefully that pays dividends. John, you just, we're going to, yeah, go. What's up, Jim? Anthony, what do you think is the weakest uh, uh, group on the team? The weakest position group? Yeah. What's the weakest position group? I'm sorry. Uh, I know this wasn't a Q and A thing. I, but no, that's good. I, it's a we good. Got a question, question from I think, Zim. <laughs> I know we got a question from listener Zim. Uh, you know, I, I actually think um, tight end might be one of the might be one of the weaker position groups right now. And I really like CJ Uzama. I think he's made a, a good career for himself based on who he was coming out of college. Drew Sample showed a, a bit of improvement last year. Uh, I think if Moss is going to do anything, it's going to have to be here with Burrow. Uh, if he's going to be, you know, be anything or do anything, but there's not, I, I think that's why at least myself, I, I think some of you guys as well, we're, we're pretty enamored with Kyle Pitts this draft, just because that's a specific weapon that you could use not only as a tight end, but at other places. Um, so right now I kind of see tight end as one of the weaker spots on the team personally. 
What about you? I think linebacker is still the weakest just because mm. there's so many question marks with it. I, like you're you're hoping that year three Jermaine Pratt, you know, is now ascending or I mean, I feel like we, do we know what he is? I like his game. It, I think it was the first Steelers game or the second game, played a really, really good game. But then half the season he goes missing. You got so many variables. We talked about Akeem Davis. We really don't know. We're banking on, you know, Marcus Bailey just being like some seventh round steal. Logan Wilson flashed a couple of different times that I think we've all seen throughout the year. Um, and I think that's probably the most consistent. But there's nobody on paper that I'm sitting there, you know, telling the opposition that, hey, look, yeah, you better be ready for this guy. Like, there's nobody in that room that I'm feeling like that with. And they went the whole draft and didn't address it at all. So I don't know. Yeah. What about so, you guys? Like, cornerback is questionable. I, I think someone said that in the comments. Like, it there's a lot of bodies there, and I, I think they addressed it very similar to last to the defensive tackle. Like, we don't want to end up in week nine having to throw Jalen Davis and LaShawn Sims out there again. So they they you know brought in obviously Chidobe, uh, Mike Hilton, Eli Apple. Like even you could throw Ricardo Allen in there because he has experience in the slot. It's just a lot of bodies and there's not really one that I think you can safely rely on that as, as of this point, like they have high expectations for Trey Waynes, but he's never really been that player. So it's just a matter of him being something that he's never really been before. Like it, it, it's tough because you absolutely need depth at cornerback. If, if guys go down, your, your toast. And we saw that last year, especially if you don't have a pass rush that you can rely on, which is a whole other thing. Who's going to step up as that guy that can consistently win one-on-one. There's no more Geno Atkins as of now. There's no more Carlos Dunlap. There's no, there's no more Carl Lawson. You don't really have a guy that you can consistently rely to get pressure. And you don't have a cornerback like William Jackson was at this peak that can shut down a, a guy in one-on-one. So there's a lot of depth. There's a lot of solid talent and you, you, you don't really have a general weakness or a red flag in terms of a guy in terms of a spot not having a starter but there's a lot of unknowns at cornerback right now and it's a very important position to have that many unknowns someone earlier in the chat asked speaking to that they asked will we go get nelson you know because he was was just going there yeah he was he was linked to us you know uh, in the reports i i I guess i just go around uh john do you, do you feel like like you would you think there's a, a a pathway that Nelson could come here or even want to come here? Is that somebody you would be interested in, Steve Nelson? I know that Mike Hilton was trying to recruit him on Twitter, which makes sense. Um, I, and I also know that if they bring in Steven Nelson, I think Darius Phillips might walk out. <laughs> he was upset <laughs> when they brought in Eli Apple and, and all those guys. Like, I'm sure he still wants to prove himself. He's in the contract year. I think they just see him as a backup that they can't rely on to stay healthy. Like, there's if they bring in Nelson, like uh, again, you have at least four or five guys that you would feel comfortable being a spot starter in some situation. But again, there's just not a lot of high tier talent there. And I think that's why some people are looking at it as a future need for like next year's draft. Ace, uh, I, w- what do you think about this? Because the, the Nelson thing, because I don't know if you guys remember. Nelson was a guy who was on Bud Dupree's Instagram, and I believe he called Joe Burrow T R A S H on uh, <laughs> after after one of those um, wins over Burrow, the one that he actually played in. I, I I don't know if that's something that is still kind of lingering out there or whatever. I I, I don't know if there would need to be kind of be some some fences mended there. I, I I'd love to hear your thoughts on that, especially with with this cornerback conversation that we're talking about. Yeah, I mean, in in regards to just that, the trash comment, I think, you know, that's just a part of the game. I don't think that he really he really meant that. I mean, the rivalry was high between the Steelers and the Bengals. And, you know, I think most people have respect for Joe Burrow. There was even the the time where I believe an Eagles defensive lineman said some some nasty things to Joe Burrow. But I think it's just all a part of the game. I think. Honestly, those guys probably have a mutual respect for each other. And I don't think that there's a way that Zach Taylor and this staff would be like, all right, we're going to sign this guy that obviously on social media said this guy was trash and Joe Burrow just not be talked about or not be brought up to him to say, hey, is it okay if we have this guy? But in terms of Steven Nelson, I actually know a little bit more about him just because from the AFC North Talk channel, I had to actually watch 
every team in this division. And Steven Nelson is a really good corner. He's not known as – like he's not a name that you hear that often. Uh, but a lot of the Steelers fans actually believe that he's one of their best free agent acquisitions of all time. And he came from the Chiefs. And he's really just been a solid corner, even if you look at his PFF grade. I believe it's around in the 67 or something like that. So he's a solid guy that I would definitely take in this locker room and at that position because as John was was saying, and I was going to say, you know, I'm not going to say corner's the weakest position, but it has a lot of question marks there. You don't have a guy that's really going to stand out at number one. You don't know exactly what Trey Waynes is. Um, some people had questions about him before he had the injury, and now he's coming off of an injury. So I think that's a room where the more competition you have, and I just think about what Paul Gunther said back in the day, you can never have too many edge rushers or corners. Um, so I would love to take Steven Nelson here. He would be a guy that could potentially come in. And there's always injuries, like Zim said. Like You have to remember at one point last year we had like practice squad corners in games, and we didn't go into the season expecting that, and that's just how the cookie crumbled. And so I think Steven Nelson – I think adding him to this locker room wouldn't be an issue. I think him and Joe Burrow, I mean, this is this is a guy in Joe Burrow that fought Devin White, and I don't think that they have problems <laughs> with each other anymore. So I'm pretty sure that they'd be able to pull it off if, if he wants to come. Well, we're going to get to some more in just a second here. I've got a couple of texts queued up, and I know we've got some others in the live chats that we all uh, want to get to. Before we do, want to talk about our partnership with Symbol it is the stock market for sports, is it not, John? You could uh, trade sports teams like their stocks, earn cash when your teams win. Again, I we put up this graphic. They gave us this graphic, and uh, 25 bucks a share, that's not where the Bengals' value is at at this point in time, but they are still a good buy based on, hey, we're talking eight or nine wins, and a lot of people on the outside don't seem to think so. But I don't know. John, tell us a little bit more about Symbol, if you would, please. What, what did we say on Wednesday, Anthony? The price after our show was <laughs> going to go back up to 60, and wouldn't you know it, it said like 62 today. It did? We are market movers. Yeah. We are market manipulators. <laughs> to the moon, Sim Bengals goes. And if you don't want to invest in the Sim Bengals right now because it's still high, you can invest in other NFL teams, NBA teams, MLB teams. It really is that simple. You just – you just uh, – Observe the stock prices for all these sim teams. Invest in your money in which teams you think are going to do good on a long-term basis. It really is that simple. It is the stock market for sports. And you can sign up using the promo code OBI to get a $10 deposit bonus when you visit www.symbol.app. That's www.simbull.app backslash OBI. Use the promo code OBI to get $10 off. You're going to need it if you want to invest in the sim Bengals right now because it's high to the moon to the moon it. for that's, sure that's, that's, I, it's funny because i always you guys talk about it. i'm i'm getting ready to sign up for that as well i'm buying heavy stock in the Bengals for sure someone in the comments the Christ christopher southern says symbol is so cool he made 20 bucks on it so far so nice awesome Not nothing like that be cool like, like that, that. Our our uh, our buddy in Graven Vids, great YouTube channel who does a lot of great NFL and Raven Raven videos. Uh, even though he's a Ravens guy, we still we still love him. Great guy, great channel. Go subscribe there. We've had him on the show. I think you guys have on your show as well. I got a text here. It's we we it's one of our regular listeners, and he kind of texts sporadically, not necessarily always when we're going on listener questions live, but he's got a lot of thoughts. His name is Ken, and I guess the question would be that's really bothering him. Uh, Jackson Carmen and the back thing, the, ba the the medicals that come with him. I, it sounds as if the Bengals are going to be relying on him pretty heavily right away, you would think, to at least compete for a starting job, if not be the starter. Uh, I, I'll start with you, Ace. How worried are you with Jackson Carmen and, and the offseason back procedure and, and some of the medicals that come with him after some people already – kind of perceived him to be a reach. I don't really think so personally, but I know a lot of other people think that that was a bit of a reach where they got him. Uh, first of all, shout out the team, keep it clean and engraving, but getting into Jackson Carmen, I think uh, I was not too worried because I've heard people who've had similar, uh, you know, injuries or, you know, ways to fix that with the hernia. I'm um, saying that it's not a big deal. I actually saw off of Zim's page today that he was practicing. So, I think if it was really a huge issue where they were scared about it, I don't think that he'd be participating in what he was doing today in rookie minicamp. So 
you know, I can check with with some people and find out, but I, I think that is kind of a non factor at this point. And I think that he probably wouldn't even be participating in it uh, based off the fact that he hasn't signed his contract or anything like that. So I think that shows enough, you know, just from the action of him being there, being in pads, unsigned and still participating in those drills. I think that that means he's good to go. What he said. <laughs> but I'm not a doctor, so don't, but, uh, don't take that to the bank. I'm not a let doctor. Me, let me speak to what, you know, like I think even when Jackson Carmen was drafted, I just think their path or the Bengals plan is vastly different than the route that I would have gone in the second round. And that's not to say that my opinion is anything, but I think a lot of people that might have felt like they reached or anything like that is because we go through mocks for like, how long were we all as fans and everybody that's in here? How long were we doing mocks? Nobody ever mocked Carmen to to the Bengals in the second. Uh, not on the second, but I think not in, John, not in the second. me and John did the third, I think. Yeah, yeah. I, third that was day. random for me. That was just third all day. But, you know, um, it's just like uh, uh, the director, uh, the scout, Mike Pasta, saying it's like if you get your guy, you know, like and it's your guy and you feel like you, you got to look at the run that happened like around it. It's, it's a lot of different factors that went into it. But. Is it who I would have drafted? And I think a lot of people just got to lose that part of it. Once they lose that part of it and just say, you know what? This guy, like, fits the bill size-wise. Uh, he protected the number one, you know, quarterback that's in this in this draft. He he did a lot of good things. He played at, 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 a, at a big school, period. And he's ready for big moments. He's got Willie Anderson's stamp of approval. Like, when people start to put all these different things together, I think it'll slowly start to curve it. But, you know, there he's got to play. And you said something about, like, he's got to battle it. No, that's the difference. That's the reason why, for me, it was, like, a little shaky of a pick is because I wasn't looking for a guy that's transitioning or I wasn't looking for a guy for the long term. I'm thinking, and I know this, that, to me, it's not a wasted pick, but it would come off as a reach if he's not starting at right guard week one because there were guards there to be had. You traded out of the spot. I love the way that they came and got the two fours. But at the same time, there are guys like Wyatt David that went like number 51 that I know is going to, you know, like he's just a guard and he's going to be a guard like for his whole NFL tenure. I think the Bengals took a little bit of a chance and said, you know what? I think this guy has the potential to play tackle. He's going to be a, he this is our guy. We've done our research. We know that the arm length is incorrect. We that's our little secret. All these different things like that. So. When people get over the whole, I didn't mock them in the second, and then actually put them all on the field. If they want to go back and look and compare them to other people, then sure, go right ahead. But I just think that's the only thing. Like if you if you look at the measurables and everything like that, the 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 guy like he's no joke. He's legit. So, but and like A said, he he practiced today. So you guys looking for clips? They're all over the internet. <laughs> to to answer the the medical side of things, I I think something that they have said numerous times they've repeated is not, not that he like, it wasn't a negative. It was a positive that he had that issue and played and finished the season with it. I think it was like the last five games that he was dealing with that herniated disc. And they noted several times, like he could have opted out. Um, he, he could have like bowed out and tried to take care of it early, but he played through it. And I think they valued that competitive toughness on, on his side. And then he took care of it via surgery in January. I don't know a lot about herniated discs. I know that it doesn't require surgical repair. Some, sometimes you can just do some other things and they can kind of go away on their own. But I don't believe it, it's something to be worried about from a long-term perspective. I think for me with Carmen, it's not the herniated disc. It's the overall weight. He came in at Clemson at 375 pounds from Fairfield, Ohio, and then got down to playing about 330 and then measured in at about 317 in his pro day. We don't know where he's going to end up in week one in terms of weight, but it's something to monitor. He's still only 21 years old, how that weight fluctuates and if he can properly, you know, manage it and keep it at a, a decent level and not have it go up to, you know, above 350 again, because that's not really going to work for what they would want him to do in the scheme. But I, I think he was at right guard um, for, for rookie minicamp between um, Deontay Smith and Trey Hill at center. So, the, 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 I think that is the expectation. He's going to come in. That That's his spot. They have guys who are going to compete at left guard, but he's going to prove his worth immediately at right guard. I don't think anyone's going to um, seriously compete for him at that spot. 
Well, we're going to be here a few more minutes. Uh, we're, we're, we've got a lot of questions showing up, and I've got some more texts coming in and whatnot. Do you guys see a couple here that are striking your interest in some of the live chats here that we may have not? Uh, there was a not funny have... one earlier, and I'm going to throw it to John. Someone asked, how did your skeleton die? <laughs> <laughs> I saw that. Yeah, so Randall back there, he's he's seen a lot of Bengals games. He, he was actually born in 2016. He was born in darkness. He'd never even seen them make the playoffs in general. He he did have skin once. He didn't have all four of his limbs. Now he only has one. You can't even see the arm that he still has. But as Andy Dolan continued to get sacked, he just continued to lose life until there was nothing left in him. And, you know, he's a, he's a skeleton, so I can still, you know, make him look like he can smile. But he's... He's legitimately dead inside, so he's he's still hanging in there though. Hey, bro, he got the perfect hat on now. Now that he's now that he's got a good wear, like a skull, like that's just so perfect. I just wanted to say that. Uh, yeah, Clay's asking what's the what's the skeleton's name? It's Randall. 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 Yeah, Randall. That is that is the skeleton's name, and he is he is the the fifth beetle, I guess, uh, if you want to call him that. I, I, saw, uh, I saw a good question. Yeah, go for it. Uh, Austin Tran says, how do you think Frank Pollock developed John Williams for the first time working on, hold up. I'm, I, I think it is a typo, but I think it's just speaking to is John, is, uh, Pollock going to be able to help Jonah Williams ascend? Like and, and everybody gets a boost. Everybody who has worked under Jim Turner, they get an immediate like attribute boost all across the board for all. If you want to look at like Madden like, terms, like he gets plus five pass block. Plus ten run block, I guess. Um, but plus Thanks. fifteen awareness, like sure, like all across the board. So Jonah Williams was already a really good player. Like he was PFF's fourth ranked player in the twenty nineteen draft class. He was really technically refined coming out of Alabama. I have to think for someone of his overall football IQ, he's hearing what Jim Turner is telling him in, in the meeting room. He said, "No, nah, I'm going to do my own thing, probably." And but even still, he's a young guy, and I'm, I'm sure he didn't want to be a dick. So I, I think he just kind of went along with some stuff, but he was already really refined coming out. The only thing, the only issues with him were on the physical side. He didn't have the longest arms. He he wasn't. He was only six four three zero two. He wasn't that great of an athlete, and that that can be you know sometimes troublesome for a young offensive tackle going up against the Joey Bosa's and and the Miles Garretts of the world for your first time. So I, I think yeah, like Frank Pollock is is a master teacher of technique and he's not going to feed him any bad information but i think jonah was already at a really good level where any improvements that you see are very marginal it's just mainly about ironing out some things and getting just overall more consistency which you tend to see from young offense linemen going into their second or third year playing just being available i mean poor poor guys just had injury issues after injury issues and you know he right when you saw him kind of start to turn a corner a little bit last year and, and start to show that that first round promise in, in some of these games. I mean, yeah, there were some inconsistencies, but it was basically a rookie year for him, essentially. And, you know, then he gets hurt again. It's like, oh, my gosh. So thankfully, he's not coming off a of surgery. But and, and he's also showing off some of the workouts. He looks like he's in, in good shape and whatnot. But if he is going to, you know, prove anything, I would think it would be under Frank Pollock. And I think that you're going to see just – Marked improvement across the line, not only from from new additions being there, but also just from a coaching standpoint. Uh, I got I got some texts from two different numbers. Uh, eight five nine area. Tats? What's that? Have you seen Jonah's new tax? Yeah, yeah. He's got to sleeve them. All sleeved out, right? That's really important. Yeah. <laughs> He's a badass now. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> Uh, I guess uh, one's from Adam from Kentucky and then another one, another 859 area code, basically asking Joe Burrow, ready week one or not? And and if so, how effective? Uh, gosh, I don't I, we'll, we'll be closing up shop here in just a few minutes. I don't know if we want to end up necessarily on this one, but uh, an important question also asking about Joe Mixon, his health and where where we think he will be week one going forward. Joey B is ready to go. Um the key is not to put pressure on him early in the season. That's that that's the short answer. But he he's ready to go. It's it's happening. Week one. It's it's LFG. Um, <laughs> and then uh, Joe Mixon. I mean you. I mean he's tweeting. <laughs> he wish the season would start right away, right now, today. Uh, part of me and people have told me like closer to the team that they just didn't see any reason to push him towards the end of the season when he could have came back. And um, he was probably ready at the end of the season. 
but um, they just didn't see the point of it uh, with the losing record. What yeah, think I is? think I think those guys are ready to go. I think uh, every indication that we've seen, you know, like Zim said, he was at uh, PBS and he saw Joe throw for 50 yards. I mean, and I think Jamar Chase also said that they'll be getting together soon. So I would expect that, especially the way that just Joey B is built in terms of just his mental fortitude and how tough he is, I think he's going to be out there week one. I think he'd be pissed off if he's not out there week one. They're going to have to strap him in somewhere if they want to sit him on the bench week one. So I think he's going to be ready to go. He'll be ready to go, but not ready enough to want to face Washington in the preseason. I'm pretty confident about that. Yeah. Uh, we're, we're getting a call, but before we get to that, this one's been asked by a couple of different people. Uh, Puka Williams, Chris Evans, their <laughs> impacts on the rock roster, if any, going forward. And I'll, uh, I'll kick it to you, Zim. Uh, I saw uh, Evans earlier today. Um, our, our good friend James sent me a bunch of clips. If you guys get a chance to check out James or opinion pages or whatever, but uh, he was there at a uh, rookie camp today. And Evans, out of everybody that we, uh, me and him talked about, he told me like he was really, really fluent, super quick, um, shouldn't miss a beat. And one of the guys that stood out to him. So um, that was pretty good. Puka with his nine toes. I, I'm not sure. If all 10 of them will be touching the, you know, like, I, I don't know. I, in my mind, I think he's like a practice squad candidate, but I, I don't know. I, I, don't, I don't Have y'all heard anything more than that? I just think for depth purposes, I just don't think it they'll, they'll have enough to carry him throughout the season. Yeah, I think the same. The, the fan base loves Puka. I've watched, you know, some of them I've heard, you know, some off the field stuff was the reason why he kind of fell and he was a good value for him. But I agree with you with, with the Chris Evans thing. I think that they're – kind of competing for that same spot in a sense, you know, depending on what they do. And so I think that it's going to be a battle. And I think, like you said, if he is a practice squad guy, he, they can easily bring him up. You know, earlier somebody said, "What? well, the Bengals aren't doing anything with depth and stuff, right, um, from the wide receiver position. Uh, two or three people have asked about Puka in the in – the, I mean, I'm sorry, Evans in, in the slot. Do you think there's any validity to that, John? hundred percent. And I know Uzi thinks so as well. Um, like Evans, I think came to Michigan as a slot receiver. I think that's where he first started for them. And then he, I think he just transitioned to a running back. He has experience at both positions. He was like running routes to today in rookie meeting camp. He was just tracking the ball over his shoulder. Like he has very natural ability at that spot. And I know Zim touched on like there, there's some, there's still support for Trent Irwin inside the building, but if they don't really have a clear-cut backup for Tyler Boyd and they want to roll with just like three or four running backs, I can definitely see Evans carving out some type of niche role as a slot receiver. Well, guys, well, we're going to close up, but we do have a phone call from our good buddy, Jason Von Stein, loyal listener. Jason, what's going on, bud? Uh, hey, I just wanted to call and just congratulate you guys. I think this is really cool. I've been listening to this since, I guess, the very beginning, but I think it's great. How you bring in Zim and Ace in. You guys are really the whole Bengals communities really coming together. It's cool to see uh, there's so many fans out there. I'm excited. Thank you. Well, I appreciate that. I, I just bring in the talented guys. You know, I, I sit back and let these guys do their thing. And then, you know, I, I pretend to be smart. And these guys are, are the talent. You know Ace, Ace is a what, legend. What's, he's uh, always, what's on he's your always mind, trying Ace, to be super hop on out of here. Got a question for <laughs> Right. Uh, no, not really. I just wanted to thank you guys for keeping up the good work. Uh, you know, I, I'm excited uh, for the season. I'm a little worried about Joe Burrow's leg, but I think, uh, you know, hopefully we can all get through this together. Well, thank you guys for keeping us posted. Uh, well, I appreciate that. I, you know, I, I guess that's kind of good timing because we were just talking about Joe Burrow and his return week one. So um, appreciate that, Jason. We'll, we'll talk to you soon. I'm sure we'll see you in the chats and whatnot. Appreciate it, bud. It's be good. All thank right. You. Uh, ended on a compliment. Why not? Got to like that, I guess. Uh, any final thoughts? Zim, I know you got to bounce out, buddy. Any final thoughts before we hop out, bud? Who <laughs> days? I don't, I don't have anything. Like, I'm, I'm excited. I feel like we get a little bit of a breathing period. But what you got for us? It is what it is. Uh, yeah, man. I'm, I'm just excited for the season. I'm glad, like, like they said, since he jungle, we're all rolling together, uh, collaborating a lot more. I definitely love that. It's a fun time to be a Bengals fan. Um, dope seeing what you guys are doing with symbol. Um, and I'm just excited to be here. Glad to be here under the SB nation umbrella and yeah. Who day. 
Zim, did I cut you off? My my headphones cut out. Did I cut you off, dude? I, I didn't really have anything to say. <laughs> I heard yeah, I heard you guys say and my headphones I, cut out. And I'm I like, like, oh we, hey, I, I, I didn't cut you say off, we dude. got a little bit of a breathing period now. We can kind of like, you know, yeah. we went through yeah. that crazy buzz all of like uh, you know, the draft and everything. But now, you know, this is a time where just keep everybody healthy. We got beautiful weather outside. Let's get it. Let's get it together. Keep the same energy and work on some new ideas. So anybody paying attention to this show today, you're a very special person for tuning in for this happy hour while I'm drinking this nice drink here. But I, I say that to say this. We have a group that is going to do some things that you're not going to get from um, some of the other Cincy outlets, I think. And I'm really, really confident in saying that. And we got some really good interviews on the way. And we got some really, really good ideas that I can't wait to implement. So please stick with us, guys. Yeah, I appreciate that. And the, the great work that you guys do. I know you, you, you've been doing some stuff on Ken Riley and a lot of great interviews. So um, it's you, you guys have been an awesome part of the podcast channel. Appreciate you guys tuning in or uh, joining in today. And I'm glad we we're able to do this. And hopefully we make it a more regular thing and uh collaborate on some of these some of these great projects too coming up that'd be cool john uh got big plans for the weekend dude any any uh anything crazy uh i think i'm just gonna prepare for the cicada invasion that's on that's inevitable i guess um they're coming back they're yeah coming they're coming back, back. uh <laughs> nothing really more than that i'm i'm sure everyone watching listening to this we get so much interaction and so much joint um intermingling between uh the or the orange black insider community and orange is the new black community and as well as new stripe city we, we have a bunch of different listeners and viewers when, whenever we collab like this so this is almost a little bit pointless to say because i know you guys are already subscribed because these guys do great work but in case you are not new stripe city on youtube orange is the new black on all your podcast outlets and obviously this channel as well go subscribe Five-star reviews, all that stuff. These guys do great work. Absolutely. Absolutely. Love having you guys all on here together. We'll do this again soon. Appreciate all of you guys. Enjoy your weekend. Thanks to all the listeners, not only for who tuned in live, but submitted questions. Thanks for listening after the fact. You can get all of our podcasts on your favorite audio streamer, YouTube channels, all that good stuff. Thanks, everybody. Have a great rest of the weekend and who day. Appreciate it, guys.